Here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, I want to begin reading to you at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 8, and we'll get into our study this Easter morning. Mark, chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. It's only been three days. Might have well have been three years. And for the disciples, it was hard for them to believe that it had all come down to this. Just a week before, Jesus had ridden on the foal of a donkey into the city of Jerusalem in what we call Palm Sunday. He had been surrounded by a multitude of people all shouting, welcoming him in. Many had spread their clothes, palm branches on the road before him as he entered. Mark in chapter 11 told us in verses 9 and 10, uh, those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The atmosphere was electric. It was charged with jubilation and filled with excitement. This was the beginning of a very momentous week in the life of Jesus and, and his men, and the week was filled with activity. When you look at your Bible and you read what took place during that last week, we read that on Monday he returned to the city of Jerusalem. As he came in, he cursed a barren fig tree, went to the temple and cleansed it. On Tuesday, he gave what is called the Mount of Olives Discourse. He was teaching there in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And he spoke to them concerning the last days and the second coming and spoke to them of judgment. The Bible doesn't say what he did on Wednesday, but on Thursday he celebrated Passover. He washed the feet of his disciples. On that night he instituted the Lord's Supper. He used bread and wine as symbols of the life that he was yielding on their behalf. And he taught his men something very simple. He said, remember me. He then went to a garden. It was there that his former follower, a man by the name of Judas, betrayed him. His disciples all forsook him and fled, and he was led away to be tried. And after this sham of a trial, Jesus was sentenced to death, and he was crucified on Friday. At this point, we need to consider what Jesus' disciples would have been going through. They went through the incredible loss, the trauma that would be produced when Jesus was taken and crucified. This miracle-working man was taken and was killed. This man that they had seen walk on water, a man that they had seen feed thousands. He could command a storm, and the storm would be quiet. He made blind men see, crippled men walk. He cleansed lepers. He even raised the dead. He was undefeated in debates with religious experts. He would silence them. And he was love in human flesh. He welcomed and transformed outcasts and sinners. Even in Gethsemane, when he was arrested, his men knew who was in charge. When the officers and soldiers entered the garden to take him, they didn't approach him. He's the one who approached them. In John 18, verses 3 through 9, John writes that Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, 
came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. This man was invincible, yet he was taken, he was crucified, and he died. And his followers were confused, and they were afraid. When Jesus had been taken, they forsook him. They fled. Some had gone into hiding in fear that they would be pursued, hunted down, and killed. And this had happened on Friday, but now it's Sunday. The Bible says in verse 1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. These women had come to the tomb bringing spices that they might anoint his body. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Last, who was an apostle. He's the son of Alphaeus. A woman by the name of Salome, who was the mother of James and John, as well as Joanna and other women were there. As it says, they came to finish the burial of Jesus Christ. Two of his disciples, a man by the name of Joseph, another by the name of Nicodemus, secured his body for burial. They had followed them, these women had followed them in order to know where Jesus had been buried. In Luke 23, verses 55 and 56, it says, The women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. They observed the tomb and how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. You see, Joseph and Nicodemus had hastily prepared Jesus' body for burial. So these women had come that they might finish the procedure. They wanted to anoint the body of Jesus because the Jews didn't embalm dead bodies. They anointed them. That was to offset the smell of decay. It was an act of love and an act of honor for Jesus. Again, three days before he'd been crucified, they witnessed his death. They came early to finish burying him. And that's what is meant when Mark says that they might come and anoint him. Him. Now this provides proof, by the way, that the death and burial of Jesus wasn't a hoax. There are those who believe and say that Jesus only appeared to die. That is a, a, a hoax or rather a, 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 a statement that was made very early in his ministry. You even see it in the, the gospel where it states that, that they were afraid that Jesus would be stolen uh, his body would be stolen by his disciples, and that's why they had set a guard around the tomb. Because very early, people had believed that Jesus' body had actually been stolen from the tomb. And there have even been books written over the centuries concerning that. So they say, well, Jesus Christ only appeared to die, or they came and stole his body. I don't know if you know this, but Islam teaches that Jesus did not die on the cross. In their Quran, in chapter 4, Verse 157, it reads, Because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger. They slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They slew him not for certain. And so this is something that's been going on for years where people have denied that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. He did not fake his own death in order to deceive people into believing that he had risen. Their coming to the tomb prepared to finish his burial speaks loudly to this. And he didn't faint. He didn't pretend to be dead and then roll away the stone. The Bible makes it very clear. He died. And Jesus died at three in the afternoon. Bodies were not to remain on a cross on the Sabbath. So a special request had been made for the body of Christ in order that it might be removed and be buried. Mark 15, 43 says that Joseph took courage and went into the governor and asked for the body. 
In requesting his body, he was confessing to be a believer, something he hadn't done before. So Joseph and Nicodemus took Jesus' body. They gave him a king's burial. It may be that they felt they didn't give him honor, the kind of honor he deserved while still alive. And so in verse 2 it says, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. The women arrived early Sunday morning. It was dawn. It was still dark. And that's a demonstration that they hadn't listened closely to him as he had taught them. Remember that Jesus had prepared his disciples for this very important day. He knew that they'd be overwhelmed with what they were about to go through. Matthew tells us in chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. They were exceedingly sorrowful. On many occasions, Jesus had taught them from the very beginning. It's recorded in John chapter 2. And several times through the Gospels, he was preparing them. But they still weren't ready. Even the night before, Jesus had once again attempted to prepare them. John 16 tells us in verse 20 that Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy, which was a picture of the fact that they were going to have joy at his resurrection. He had taught them that he would die. He had taught them he would be resurrected. And he wanted them to know and believe that death would not have the final victory. He would definitely die, but he would be raised from the dead. But that message was too deep for them to understand. You see, the reason, part of the reason is, is because in all human experience, death is absolutely final. In the book of Job, in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, we read, man who is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower, fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Death is finality. There are, are few things that speak with the authority and the finality of a funeral. There's something about attending a funeral that actually sobers you up. Funerals cause us to consider the brevity of life, the inevitability of death. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, it says, Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. The living will take it to heart. You go to a funeral, and it makes you sober-minded. You go to a party, and you don't learn anything. And so the writer of Ecclesiastes says that it's, it's better to mourn than to be always laughing because you get a sobriety and you understand finality. You see, in the midst of the pain you go through, we might even forget we've been, what we've been taught about resurrection. When you're there viewing the body of someone you love deeply, it has an impact that's immeasurable. And the grief is sobering. It's like time suddenly stops as you view this and experience this pain. And during that time, we might even forget what we've been taught in our Christian teachings about resurrection. Viewing that body is just an immeasurable moment for us. The reality of death can cause us to forget all that we would claim we believed. Like in the case of Martha and Jesus, after Martha's brother Lazarus had died. When Lazarus died, Martha began to speak to Jesus. It's recorded in John chapter 11, verses 21 and 22. John says that Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And so Jesus responded. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked that question that he'd ask us today. He asked her, do you believe this? Though Jesus had prepared them for this day, it was beyond belief. As understandable as it is, in reality, their actions were built on doubt and not on faith in God. They'd been instructed to have joy through all they were going through. Death wasn't going to have final victory. They should rejoice at its defeat. In John 14, 28, Jesus said, You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice 
because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father's greater than I. But there they are at the tomb, and they have a question that needs to be answered. Verse 3 says, they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? Who will roll away the stone from the door? The stone was in the shape of a wheel. It was on an incline. It would roll into a groove cut out of rock, and it would seal the tomb. It weighed a ton and a half to two tons. It was impossible for these women to roll back the stone up that incline. Their unbelief provokes them to create an imaginary need that was impossible to meet. And as they're speaking amongst themselves, who's going to roll away this, this stone? Verse 4 says, when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. Their concerns had been answered. They needed no one to roll away the stone. Matthew 28, 2 says, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. There are things that you go through that you're going to be saying, who can roll away this stone? Well, the problem is, is you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it with your own power. You cannot do it with your own will. You cannot do it with your own intellect. The stones in your life can't be removed in that way. I discovered a long time ago, and many of you have too, that the one who does the impossible, who rolls away the stone, is God himself. God has a way of taking the impossible that we have, the situation in front of us that we cannot answer and we cannot, we cannot find a solution to. God has a way of saying, I could roll away that stone. And some of us have to understand that today. There are things in your life that are like stones that are blocking you. And God is saying, listen, I have the ability to roll that away so you can find life. You see, that stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out but that the world might enter in to see that he's alive he isn't dead he is no longer in that grave he's alive and he still rolls away stones in our life it says in verse 5 entering the tomb they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed but he said to them do not be alarmed you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. So they enter in, and there's an angel. Matthew mentioned him. And very often in the Bible, angels appear in human form, and he speaks to them. He says, don't be alarmed. In other words, fear not. Calm down. <laughs> but they were startled. And tells them in verse 6, he's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. You have come to the right tomb, but Jesus is no longer here. Now this provides them with visible proof. The place he had been laid to rest is now empty. In John 20, verses 6 and 7, it says, Simon Peter came following John, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself, an evidence of Jesus being gone. And so they see this, and it says in verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Even though they had fled that night in the garden, there's still a place for them. Remember that Jesus had given a parable of a lost sheep, how that the shepherd left the other sheep and went looking for the one that was lost? Like that sheep, Jesus was calling his disciples home. But Peter especially needed comfort because it was the apostle Peter that had claimed that he would never deny the Lord. Just recently, as they were there at the Passover supper, remember how Jesus was speaking, and he was sharing with them what was about to take place. And as he was speaking, the apostle Peter had said, though all were to deny you, though all were to forsake you, he said, I never would. I never will. He said, I would even die for you. And remember how Jesus looked at him and said, will you? I tell you this night, you will deny me three times. And he was more vehement. He was so upset. How could you say that I would deny you? This is 
Peter, this is the one who so many times had been the center of our attention in the Gospels. He, he's the one who, when others stayed in a boat, he's the one who climbed out of that boat and, and walked towards Jesus Christ. He was a brave man. He was the man that, that when, when Jesus was in the garden, just later on, how, he was the one who, who, when the soldiers came, the detachment of soldiers and, and officers came to take Jesus, it, it was the apostle Peter who, who took out his sword and, and went after the first person that he could hit, a man by the name of Malchus. And we re, remember the story of how he hit him on the side of the head and cut off his ear. And, and Jesus told him, put your, your sword away and, and healed Malchus. And, and Peter had demonstrated even that night that if I have to be taken down, I'll be taken down. I will give up my life for you. I told you I love you. I love you more than these. I will do that. I love you that deeply. But it was the apostle Peter who later on went into a garden. And he was there with John. And he saw Jesus. Jesus looked at him. And Peter remembered what Jesus had told him because he had been there by a fire and he had denied knowing the Lord three times and he hears the rooster as it crows and Jesus looks at him and, and he went out, Luke tells us, and he, he wept bitterly. This is the one who failed him miserably. This is the one who said, I would die for you. I wonder how many in this room have ever said to the Lord, God, I'm your man, I'm your woman, you might say, and whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'm there, to, I'm there for you. You know, the people that I knew when I first got saved, they've, they've walked away from you. Lord, but not me. I'm going to remain faithful to you. I'm going to follow you to the end. And then you find yourself slipping away step by step. Listen, backsliding isn't an instantaneous thing. It's a series of small decisions that leads you to a place that you never thought you could come back to. It doesn't happen instantly, guys. Some of you know what I'm saying. It starts with a single decision that moves you into a place that has actually taken you back. You just don't realize, oh, no, I'm going to go with my friends to this party and I'm going to hang with them, but I'm going to be there to be a witness to them. It starts out sometimes with noble things, noble causes, noble reasons. I'm going to do this. Yeah, I'll go back to this, but only because I want to witness to those guys at the bar or I'm going to go off for the weekend. We're going to go to this place and do these things. They'll do it. I won't. They're going to drink their beer. I'm going to drink my water. It's going to be fine. I'll tell them about Jesus. You had a good heart and you started to slip away and now you wake up and you wonder, how did I get here? What happened? And there are a lot of people like that. A lot of people who started well but didn't finish well. A lot of people who began, who made claims, God, I love you, who wept during worship, who went forward at an invitation, who said, God, I'm your person. I will do what you call me to do. Then you meet an unbeliever and you hook up and before you know it, you got a baby. And, and what happened? Where did it go? And you may be thinking, uh, I said I would never let you go, but Lord, it seems that I have. And that's why Jesus is speaking because Peter had said, I would die for you. He was broken hearted. He was in terrible pain because he, the man who said, I love you more than these, is the one who had fled with the others. He had forsaken him. And so what does Jesus do here? Jesus reaches out in verse 7. It says, tell his disciples and Peter. Let Peter know I still love him. Listen, I want to tell the backslider today something that you need to hear. You really do. Jesus still loves you. Jesus still loves you. He hasn't stopped loving you. He still cares for you. He died for you. And he loves you with all of his heart. And he's willing to receive you back. You simply need to say, God, God, I'm a miserable sinner. Forgive me for walking away. God, help me. The Lord has a word for your ear today. It's to you. He's speaking right now. And he's saying, you need to hear this. He died for the sin of the whole world, which includes yours. He knew what you would do with the gospel when he gave it to you and you received it. He knew what you would do and he still loved you and he still gave you that gospel. Why? Because his love is forever. Jesus Christ forgives all sin, all manner of sin, no matter how much sin. He has the ability to do that and he will do that. You need to understand it. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all all sin, not just some sin or past sin from years ago. He forgives us for 
all sin. And when we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he doesn't say, no, you've already filled up your cup of ugly. I don't need that. I'm not going to forgive you. No, he says, I will forgive you. And if you come to me tomorrow, I'll forgive you again. And if you come to me next week, I'll forgive you again. Go and tell Peter I'm alive. Go and tell him he's broken hearted. And that's what happens. He needed comfort. He boasted. I'll never deny him. And so these words are intended to communicate grace to a broken-hearted man. Peter, you failed miserably, Jesus would be saying, but my love and my grace is sufficient for your recovery. And so they went out. Verse 8 says they went out quickly. They fled from the tomb. <laughs> they trembled. They were amazed. Said At first, they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid. They went out quickly. At first, they didn't dare to speak. They were that afraid. But they did go, and they did tell the apostles. And by their writings, the apostles told us. What did they tell us? Well, they tell us this. The apostles in their writings tell us sin is terrible. Sin separates us from God. And it results in eternal condemnation. Sin affects every element of being. Everything about us. And every person is a sinner. There's none righteous, Romans 3.10 tells us. No, not one. In Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The apostles told us that sin must be dealt with on an individual and personal level. Romans 6.23 says all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. They told us that ultimately, when not dealt with, it results in judgment. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men to die once after this judgment. They told us God loved the world and he gave us Jesus Christ to save us. Jesus, on our behalf, took upon himself the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God. He took upon himself the sin of the world, which includes ours. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the Apostle Peter, who learned this lesson, writes, Christ also suffered when he died for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners that he might bring us safely home to God. He suffered physical death but he was raised to life in the Spirit. They told us that our salvation rests on the fact of his resurrection. Had he not been raised from the dead, belief in him would not matter. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ isn't risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Because Jesus conquered the grave, we are now overcomers. We have hope for the future. We have the power of God's Spirit within us. We're being transformed daily. We experience love and peace in a hostile world. We're blessed by God. And we have the promise of heaven awaiting us. And Romans 8, 11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and the Spirit who raised Him dwells in you. You are a temple of the Spirit of God if you're born again, if you've committed your heart to Christ. You are the temple of the Spirit of God. The same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That's why we can also say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Because the sting of, of, of sin is death. But guess what? We have victory in Jesus Christ. Because He lives, we live also in Him. We have been forgiven. We don't worship a dead teacher. We worship a living Savior. We worship the one who yielded His life up for us. The one whose blood cleanses us from all sin, the one whose spirit indwells and empowers us, the one who took our name and wrote it in the Lamb's book of life, the one who one day will say, come up here and we will be with him and then we will see him face to face and we will say, God, I love you. Thank you for what you've done for me. I followed you because you loved me and gave yourself for me. That's our Savior. He's alive. He's not dead. Buddha's dead. Muhammad's dead. Confucius is dead. But Jesus Christ is 
alive. He's alive this morning. He's alive. He's alive. We worship a living Savior. And He forgives us of our sin. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And He empowers us by His Holy Spirit. There's not a sin that God will not forgive. If you yield it to Him, He will wash it clean. And you, He will take your sin. And as far as the east is from the west, so far will He separate your sin from you. Never the two will ever meet again. God looks at you as the one who has what is called the imputed righteousness of Christ. When He looks at you, He sees His Son's perfection. It's not what you have done. It is what He has done for you. And that's why we're alive in Christ. That's the Christian message. It isn't works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I didn't work my way into heaven. I received it as a gift. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. I believe that. I said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Wash me and cleanse me and fill me with your power. And I've been following Jesus Christ for 48 years. And I can tell you, He is alive and living today and changes life. I have seen God move and He will continue to do so. So he will continue to do so. And if you haven't received Christ, I invite you to do so today. If you haven't said, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. One, if you don't think you're a sinner, you must not be married. Because <laughs> I'm sure your spouse has let you know. Every one of us sins and falls short of the glory of God. It's not somebody else's fault. There are things that contribute to my sinfulness in the way that I express it but I sin because I'm a sinner by nature that's what I am I am when I'm born I'm born with this dark soul and I do evil things and I will do those because by nature that's what I do I cannot make myself righteous because my sin is that deep I need a cleansing. My own works can't cleanse me, but the blood of Jesus Christ, which is perfect and pure, can. And He washes you and cleanses you by His blood. That's how it works. And you say, I, I, I need to be cleansed. I remember somebody who said, well, you know, he was saying to a Christian, you know, you're brainwashed. And the Christian's response was, indeed, my brains were filthy, dirty, and they needed a good washing. And Jesus Christ washed that with His blood. There's no doubt about that. And if you're crippled right now, if you're like the Apostle Peter and you're just dealing with grief and denial and things that you've done, Jesus Christ would be saying and tell you, and tell you, He's alive. He forgives. He will cleanse you. He will receive you. He will transform you. He loves you. And all He's asking you to do is turn from your wicked ways. Turn to Him and watch the miracle that your life will become. Think about the people that will be impacted when your life is transformed. Think about what God can do when you finally say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I have a friend of mine right now in this, in this room who I went to high school with. I've known him since I was 14 years old. He's in this room right now. And uh, I knew him when we were 14 years old. He sure has gotten old. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he was coming to this church for a year and didn't know it was me because of the transformation God had done in my life. He said, that couldn't be my friend from high school. God can change your life to become unrecognizable to those you used to party with and those who knew you best. God can change your life. You yield to Him and watch what He'll do. Do you have sin in your life that needs to be dealt with? Jesus Christ can deal with it. It takes humility on your part. You have to say to Him, God, I agree with you. And the scripture says if you confess your sin, the word confess simply means, it's a Greek word, homo legeo. It simply means to say the same thing. God says you are unrighteous. You are simply saying, I agree with you, God. I'm unrighteous. You're confessing. God, forgive me, a sinner. And God says, I will forgive you. You've come. You've asked. I will grant it because you're real. You want to know God. And I believe today there are people in this room that God is speaking to. You may have been raised in a Christian home. 
You may have at one time professed to be a faithful follower of Christ. You walked away. Or you may be somebody who was raised in a church abiding home. People who went to church. You went to church. You may have gone through the various rituals that your church offered, but you never were transformed. You've never had an assurance that you really know him. Perhaps you've tried hard. You may be even the best person that anybody could know, but you don't know Jesus Christ. And because you don't know Jesus Christ, he will say to you in judgment, you will say, I never knew you. But when you open your heart to Christ and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he receives you and forgives you. He washes you, changes you, and one day he'll welcome you into his kingdom. He'll look at you and say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. This has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And one of these days, one of these days, and guys, it's not that long, not that long, the voice is going to say, come up here, and the church will be gone, and we will be seeing him face to face, and we'll be able to say to him, oh, Lord, I've already rehearsed. I pray I'm able to do this. I, I, just, I just want to do this. I want to look at him. I want to say to him, I'm looking into the eyes of the one who wept for me. I'm looking into the, the, the man who laid his life down on that cross for me, and all I want to do when I see him is just say, thank you, Jesus. I love you. That's all, I, that's all I can do. Thank you, Jesus. Can you say more? Can you say more? No. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. And it's not that long till we'll see him face to face. Either you'll see him as Savior or you will see him as judge. But you will see him. And I want to encourage you today to receive him as your Savior because you don't want him to be your judge.